With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, the the uh, series we've been doing this summer uh, has to do with the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is a set of uh, character qualities, Christian character traits, which uh, most fa- the most famous list is in Galatians chapter 5, where Paul lists them as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And this week, we're taking a look at the one that's called goodness. Now, I'm not sure anybody in our culture actually thinks <clears throat> that right now, in our time in history, that people are becoming more and more good. <clears throat> There's a lot of ways to describe what's going on in society, but almost nobody says people are just becoming more and more good. Uh, last two weeks, there's, uh, in the New York Times, there's been two interesting articles. Uh, one last week was called, uh, entitled, Web Trolls Winning as Incivility Grows. And today, in the New York Times, in the review section, the, the lead editorial was entitled, Dealing with Digital Cruelty. Now, the occasion for the articles both have to do with when Robin Williams committed suicide his daughter's uh, social media sites were bombarded with gruesome pictures. And she just said, I'm off Twitter. And, and the, uh, uh, but those articles were not just you know, triggered by that one incident, even though that was a, uh, a, the occasion for the article. The point is that this kind of behavior is very widespread. And if you read the articles, the main takeaways, there's all sorts of theories and academics weighing in on, on, on this, but the main, th- things you come away with is this. Number one, there's a lot of darkness in the human heart. The human heart is capable of tremendous cruelty and evil. Number two, that if anything pulls the social pressure away that keeps that down and keeps it hidden, you know, it explodes. The the anonymity of the internet is one way in which awful stuff happens. Why? What's wrong with people? Well, they're just people. And on the internet, they... uh, you know, uh, the anonymity makes it possible to do the things that otherwise you just wouldn't feel like you could do out of self-interest. And another, uh, by the way, example of that is the great uh, novel by William Golding, Lord of the Flies. I don't know if any of you ever read that or ever saw the old movie, the old black and white movie, but it's what happens when a group of very, very, very civilized English schoolboys are shipwrecked on, a, on an island, and there, where all the social pressure of civilization is off, the natural human nature, the will to power, the, the capacity for cruelty comes out. N- n- uh, no wonder C.S. Lewis says what human beings need is not improvement, they need redemption. Uh, we, we don't need to become nicer people, we need to become new people. Now when the Bible talks about goodness, when the word good is used, including here in this famous text, it means something like that, much more radical than what the English word good usually denotes, which is some kind of bland niceness. So we're not, I'm not going to be spending like, here's th- here, I'm not going to be talking about goodness till near the end of this sermon, because I want to show you that if you want to understand what the Bible means by good, you have to first ask an extremely important question, and in the course of answering that question, finally you come to see what is good. This famous passage out of the Old Testament book of Micah starts with a question. It poses a question. According to the Bible, the greatest question anybody can ask, the most important question you can pose. And there's a great question, and then there, that's in the very beginning, and then after that, there's two wrong answers, and after that, there's the right answer. So let's break the passage down and move through it like this. The great question, the wrong answers to the question, and the right answers. First, the great question. What's the great question? Verse 6, the first half of verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? 
with what shall I come before the Lord? Now, what to come before God or anyone in uh, Semitic terminology meant to, to stand in relationship to them. To come before someone means I'm in a relationship with you. But Micah says, what shall I do to stand before the exalted God? That's the question. How can I have a relationship with a transcendent, exalted God? How can I come into his presence? How can I know him? All ancient cultures believed that behind the immensities of the natural universe was an even greater immensity, the ultimate mystery, a divine, transcendent, ultimate, absolute power. That behind the natural universe, there was a transcendent, absolute, divine power. And all ancient cultures believed that we were small before that power, that, there was, that, 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 that God is eternal and we're mortal. He has shown you, O oh, mortal. God's eternal and we're mortal. Uh, God is uh, immense and we're small. God is uh, you know, infinite and we're finite. God is pure and holy and we are flawed. God can see the end from the beginning. He can see all things in time and space. We can only see a little bit. And therefore, all ancient cultures believed that there was a transcendent divine power behind the universe and that <laughs> it was huge and we were small and there was a gap between us. There was a chasm between us. That's the reason why all ancient cultures had temples. Why? Because nobody believed you could just connect to the divine transcendence. You could just talk to the divine transcendence. There was a gap. There was a chasm. And the distance had to be mediated by priests and sacrifices and rituals and things like that. Nobody thought you could just snap a finger and talk and somehow you would have a connection with the great transcendent. No, there's this gap and we have to bridge the gap somehow. Now, we today are the first culture in the history of the world to completely lose a sense of that distance between us and the transcendent God. We've completely lost the idea of a distance, that there's some kind of gap. Um, most people in America, for example, believe in God. There's only 2.4% of the population say they're atheists. Only another 3, per, three point something percent say they're agnostic. So a little over 5% of the, of the population say they, they don't believe in God, and 95% do. And yet, sociologists have studied, especially the religious views of younger Americans, and it's overwhelmingly obvious when you read the studies that the idea of a transcendent God, of an inscrutable God, of a God who, to whom we owe everything and he owes us nothing, a God who's infinitely holy and sovereign and has the right to do with us as he pleases, that that God is not in the concept of the average American. We believe in God, the sociologists say, but the idea of there being a gap, the idea of there being, you know, that God is transcendent, there's a chasm, uh, that something has to bridge that distance and mediate that distance, that's, that's out of there. Because when everybody says they believe in God, they believe in a spirit of love, they believe in God who can, they can just talk to anytime and God helps them. Now, the ancients would have looked at modern people's understanding of God and they would have said, you're crazy. And you're also being logically inconsistent. Think about this. Do you believe that there is a God who created the world? You know, the average American would say, yeah. Do you believe God created the world? Yes. Well, look at that world. Look at the oceans and the mountains and look at the overwhelming fire at the heart of the planet. And look at the stars and look at the infinite number of galaxies. Look at the immensities and infinities of all the universe. If there's a God who created that and sustains that every second, is that the kind of person you can just talk to? You can just go into a little bit of meditation? Is this the kind of God that... Uh, somehow owes you to let your life go well? Would you look at all that universe and conclude that God was just a warm, fuzzy spirit of love? Nonsense. Nonsense. See, the, the question that Micah asks, which is by and large a question that is kind of incomprehensible to the average American, but is not incomprehensible to most people in the world even today, 
and most people in the world in the history of the world, and that is this, this exalted God, and if there is a God, God is exalted. How in the world can I have a relationship? How can I, finite, flawed, limited, how is it possible for me to come into a relationship with this great and exalted God? That's the question. Now, first, Micah gives us the two answers that are wrong. They're in the second half of six and, the, and then uh, seven. Now, here's what the two, an- two wrong answers are. The first wrong answer is, basically, shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? That's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer here is no. I mean, even in English, you can tell these are rhetorical questions, and the answer is no. But here's the first thing he's saying. All the wealth in the world would not suffice as a burnt, a burnt offering. Now, what's a burnt offering? So you notice it says, shall I come with, uh, before him with burnt offerings? Uh, calves a year old were very, that was a very expensive meat because calves are very tender. But um, thousands of rams would be even more expensive of an offering. And 10,000 rivers of oil is, in our, you know, in, in today's currency would be billions of dollars. But rivers of oil, it's almost like he's saying, if I could bring you all the wealth on the planet, would that, suffice as a burnt offering. Burnt offerings in the Old Testament sacrificial system were not ways of atoning for sin. Burnt offerings were ways of giving your life. And so, Micah is saying, what if I just gave my whole life? What if I said, here's all my wealth, here's all I am, here's everything, I'm gonna live for you, I'm gonna try, I'm going to surrender to you, would that suffice? Would that merit a relationship with the exalted God? And of course the answer is no. By the way, New Yorkers need to see this, of course, because New Yorkers tend to believe that everybody's got his price, that everybody can be bought, and Mike is saying, not God. Okay, then he moves on and asks a, what seems like a really outrageous question. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now here he's not talking about a burnt offering. It's very clear. This is a sin offering. And in the Old Testament sacrificial system, when you sinned, when you did something wrong, you brought a sin offering in order to atone. Now, if you've ever wronged somebody and you feel tremendously guilty about it, what do you do? You go and you say, is there anything I could do to put this right? Is there anything I can do? to atone, basically, for what I've done. Now, sometimes, if what you've done to the person isn't enormous, sometimes it's actually quite possible to pay the price and atone for your sin. You know that. If it's a a minor thing, if if you've cost them something, but it's possible to actually pay for that, you can actually make up for it, and you can actually atone for your sin. As you know, even at the human level, Many, many things we do to people, if we harm their reputation, we harm, I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which you could really hurt somebody and sin against them, and there's no pe- price you could pay to undo the damage. But here, first of all, Mike is saying, let me come up with the most unimaginable pain I can think of. How about the pain of losing your firstborn son, your, your, your child. Imagine unimaginable pain, terrible pain, right? And he's saying here that even if I would submit to that voluntarily, that kind of pain, all the greatest personal pain and agony in the world would not atone for my sin. Why? Because a sin against an infinite God is an infinite debt. God has not only created you, but he keeps you alive every second, which means you, 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 in a sense, owe him your entire life millions of times over. How many seconds have you had in your life? And because we live as if we own ourselves, which is a form of plagiarism at least, and treason maybe, by human standards, our sin is too great for us to atone for. And therefore, the two wrong answers is, is there a way in which I could just surrender my life and live for him? Would that do it? No. It's all the wealth in the world wouldn't serve as a burnt offering? Is there any kind of pain I could inflict on myself in order to pay, f- atone for my sin against God? No, all the personal pain and agony in the world would not atone for the sin. And see, what this really means is there's nothing you can do to merit or warrant a relationship with his exalted God. 
Um, I think it's actually uh, something that the average person still doesn't believe. The average person says, well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, some of the sociologists have said that when they study what young Americans believe about religion, most of them say that if I live a good life according to my own standards and God sees that I'm trying my very hardest, then I really believe that God will answer my prayers and he will love me and he will help me and all that sort of thing. So they don't believe this. Micah says, no, it doesn't work. You don't understand how big God is and you don't understand how flawed you are. So we still have the question. How can we come before, um, you know, and have a relationship with this exalted God? Now, here's the right answer. It's in verse 8, but, uh, um, and some of you are saying, I can't believe you got to the third point so soon. (laughs) You know, I know you, and I time you, and uh, this is really early to come to the third of three points. It's a long point, dears. It's a long point. (laughs) Because if you're going to understand verse 8, which is one of the most famous verses in the Bible, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you to act justly, to to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Uh, I went to Bucknell University. That was on the back. That was inscribed in these huge letters on the back of the Rook Chapel when you first went onto the campus. I saw it every day, practically. You know, what does the Lord require of you just to act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? And as it is, up there on the back of the Rook Chapel at my university, sort of contextless, just stuck up there, with no, not knowing anything else about the, the Bible. You know what it looks like? It's saying, hey, hey, you don't have to be religious. You don't have to do all these offerings and things like that. You just try your best to live a good life and to, you know, be merciful and, and maybe pray and walk humbly with your God. You know, contextless means everybody has to decide what God you believe in. You have your God, I have my God. Just walk humbly with your God. That's the reason why it was up on the back of the chapel. Because taken out of context, the verse just says, you figure out what you think about God and what you think is right and wrong, and you live according with that, and that's all that's all that's necessary. Now, have you ever had anything that you said taken out of context? You know how infuriating it is? Right? Okay. If you said something and then they say, well, you know, you said, well, yeah, I know, but I also always say this. Or if you read the rest of the paragraph, uh, if you, you take that out of context, you're twisting the words. If you need to put it into context, you say, to understand the true sense of what I mean. It's very upsetting. Well, um, I think it's very unfair to do this. Uh, let's take a look at the context of this verse, and then we'll go and look at the text itself. Why? The context tells us how to get this relationship with God. The text tells us how to conduct this relationship with God. Now, what do we mean by the context? Well, look at the rest of the Old Testament. Micah is an Old Testament prophet. And if, if you think, well, all this is saying is you don't need to do all these sacrifices and all these religious observances. You just try your best to live in the way that you think is right. First of all, that's denying one of the main messages of the entire Old Testament, which is, that you do need atonement for sin. It's not enough just to live, try to live a good life. That famous verse in Isaiah, the prophet says, all of your righteousness, your very best deeds are like a filthy rag before God. And when, uh, when God brought the people of Israel together at Mount Sinai, you remember what he did? He says, you're my people now. He brought them out of Egypt. He delivered them with his mighty hand. He saved them. He brings them to Mount Sinai. He says, I'm now going to constitute you to be my people. And he says, I'm going to give you two things. Remember what they were? The Ten Commandments, the law of God, here's how you should live, and the, whole, and the tabernacle and all the sacrifices. You know why? The Ten Commandments was the way in which God wanted them to live. God says, I want you to live this way. Well, then why did he give them the tabernacle? Because he knew they wouldn't live that way. They knew that no one is going to love God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind and love his neighbor as himself. And therefore, there needs to be atonement for this sin. So you can't read verse 8 as really saying that you don't need atonement for your sin. Verses 6 and 7 is simply saying you can't do the atonement. You can't do the atonement, but the atonement has got to be there. You can't just simply say, well, I'm going to try my best. No. So that's first context is the Old Testament says there must be sacrifice for sin. There has to be atonement. The other thing, second thing, if you go to the New Testament, what verses 
eight, what verse eight, it says, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That's the Old Testament version of the two great commandments. In the New Testament, Jesus is always saying, I can summarize the whole law in two great commandments. It all boils down to this. Love God, walk humbly with your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do justly and love mercy. But in the New Testament, whenever Jesus brings up the two great commandments, he never, he never does it in order to say, see, just try your best, and that'll be fine. When he talks to the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, when he talks to the, uh, to the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, these are people who think they're pretty good. I'm pretty good. I'm fine with God, don't you? And Jesus wants to show them that they need grace, they need mercy, they need forgiveness. And so what does he do? He says, well, what does the law require? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus always gets those two things out to show you that you are not fulfilling the law. Yes, that is what the Lord requires. Those two things. The Lord requires that. And if you think you come ever, even close to fulfilling those requirements, you don't understand. Um, the, the early 18th century British movement that eventually became the Methodists, Charles Wesley, John Wesley, George Whitfield. The Methodist movement, um, in the very beginning, the, the, the young men who were the leaders of that movement were really trying very, very hard to live according to the law of God, and especially to the law of, see, when, when you read the Ten Commandments, it tends to focus on behavior, don't kill, don't steal, that sort of thing. Then it gets down to don't covet, which of course goes into the heart. And when Jesus actually sums up the commandments, He doesn't just say, live this in this way. Of course, you're not supposed to kill, you're not supposed to steal, you're not supposed to commit adultery. But what he's actually saying is, I want you to love God. I want you to love God so much that you'll never covet. I want you to love your neighbor so much that you love them as if they were you. And when you begin to think out the implications of what those commandments are, you see, yes, that's what God requires, but there's no way that you can fulfill that requirement. Here's a set of questions that a couple of the early Methodists used to use at, at, at night to look back on their day to see whether they actually loved God with their whole heart and loved their neighbor as themselves. Now listen carefully. I'm only going to give you like a third of them because you know what? You won't be able to bear it. Now imagine, getting, imagine thinking back on your day in a very specific way and asking these questions to yourself. Have I not only prayed today but been fervent in prayer? Have I practiced God's presence at least every act hour speaking directly to him? Have I before every deliberate action or conversation considered how I might do it with God's glory in mind? Have I given thanks to God after every pleasure, any good thing I've experienced? Have I avoided proud thoughts or have I avoided comparing myself to others? Have I always admitted when I was wrong swiftly and happily Have I thought or spoken unkindly of anyone? Did you hear that? Have I thought or spoken unkindly of anyone? Have I sought to center each conversation on the other person's needs, or did I turn it always toward myself and my interests? Did I ever twist the truth to look good? Have my words today been honest, few, wise and apt, calm and warm, Have I harbored lots of anxious thoughts or have I cast them all on the Lord, completely trusting him? Have I wasted my time or have I used it well for the benefit of those around me or for my own spiritual, mental, or spiritual growth? So he broke off because they could bear it no longer. That's just the beginning of thinking specifically about what it would mean to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and neighbors yourself. That's what what Mike is saying. That's all the Lord requires of you. That's also spelled out in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. Anybody who says, well, I'm not really a believer in God. I'm really not sure. I think what really matters is you live a good life. I just try to live according to like the Sermon on the Mount. Love. And, and of course, that shows you haven't read the Sermon on the Mount. Because what the Sermon... Uh, David Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say, anyone who's read the Sermon on the Mount will cry out, God save me from the Sermon on the Mount. Because there's no way I could possibly live like that. So if you put this in context, you see your sin must be atoned for. It just can't be atoned for by you. And you'll also see that 
this is simple. Of course this would be what God requires. This is exactly what God requires, but there's no way you can fulfill the requirement. But here's one more thing you've got to understand. If you want to put Micah in context, and that is this, this case study, this illustration, shall I get, offer my firstborn for my transgression for the sin of my soul? Now, some of you might have gone, Ugh, what a horrible idea. And they said, well, it's just a rhetorical device, you know, trying to show us that. Well, it's not. Because when Micah uses this illustration, he's actually looking back into the, all the way going to back, back to practically the beginning of the Bible, and he's looking forward to the end. This is the thread that shows you where Micah fits in the narrative arc of the whole Bible. If you go back to the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, there's a very curious requirement, and that is the Old Testament law says that the firstborn, the, the life of the firstborn of every family is forfeit because of the family's sin, and therefore a ransom has to be paid, which meant a, 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 you know, a, a cost, a, a payment had to be made to the tabernacle. Now, none of the firstborn died. What in the world does that mean? that the life of the firstborn is forfeit in every family, and only if the life of the, forf the, ran uh, the firstborn is ransomed, a sacrifice is made, <clears throat> can his life be spared. Now, here's what we don't understand, because we're individualists. In the, uh, but that's right, I told you this is going to be a long point. Because I'm trying to help you understand the context of this passage. We are an individualistic society. The idea that the firstborn son got all the inheritance in old times seems very inequitable. And of course, maybe it was. But don't forget, this is before we had money. He didn't really have money. I mean, you did have shekels and things like that. But by and large, things weren't liquid. The assets of a family was the land and the buildings and the, and the livestock and that kind of thing. And the only way that a family could maintain its position in society, whatever position that was, is if, is if you didn't divide that up amongst the children. In other words, the firstborn son got, became the head of the estate and, of course, cared for all the siblings, etc. And therefore, in a certain sense, the firstborn son represented the hope of the family. And when it said the life of the firstborn son is forfeit, you have got to pay a ransom, that was God's way of saying, you all deserve to die for your sins. The wages of sin is death. Because of your sins, you all deserve to die. And the firstborn son, of course, in a sense, was the federal head, the representative of the family. And therefore, you all deserve to die, but I will accept a ransom, I will accept a sacrifice. See, sin is atoned for. It's a, it's, it was a symbol for the fact that wages of sin is death. And this is the reason why one of the most famous stories of the Bible happened the way it did. When God came to Abraham and said, take your son Isaac your only son whom you love, and go up on the mountain and offer him there as a sacrifice. It was excruciating for Abraham. It was agonizing for Abraham. But he didn't say, what are you talking about? Because he knew what God was doing, at least what he thought God was doing, was he was calling in the debt, calling in the payment, for the sins of the family, the firstborn would die. It didn't, in other words, it wasn't a crazy idea for Abraham. It just was an agonizing idea that for whatever reason, God seemed like he was, he was calling in the debt. And so he walked up that mountain and he got to the top and he stretched his hand out, ready to sacrifice his son. And then, of course, you know how the story goes. God says, stop, do not slay the lad. Now I know that you love me. For you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love, from me. Oh, it's a wonderful story. Happy ending. You know, Abraham gets Isaac back. He's no longer an idol of his heart and all that stuff. You know, you maybe know how that story goes. But here's the real question. Why? Why did God decide not to take the payment for the sin of that family through receive, taking the firstborn's life. Why not? We know why not. You see, 
this verse connects not only to the past, but to the future, to the end of the Bible. Because we get to the New Testament, we know this. The reason why God does not require your life or my life, the reason why he can forgive us, the reason why he doesn't require the life of the firstborn, was because God the Father himself, as it were, walked up the mountain, Mount Calvary. Completely alone. Jesus was so alone. And he offered up his firstborn son. And there was nobody up there to say, stay thy hand. And Jesus Christ died on the cross, God's firstborn for us. Atoning for our sins, the atonement that, that couldn't be done any other way. And when you see Jesus Christ dying on the cross, you can cry. We can all cry to the Father. We can take the same thing that God said to Abraham and send it back to heaven. And you know what we can say? Now we know that you love us. For you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. Only when you connect this passage to the the beginning of the Bible, the Old Testament, and all that stuff about the ransom of the firstborn and Abraham and Isaac, to the end of the Bible where Jesus Christ is offered up, God offers his own firstborn son so that we do not have to die. Can you know how to have a relationship with God? How can I go before the exalted God? Here is how. Pointing to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ saying, Father, accept me because of what Jesus has done. And now you see what the word your God means. To act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It doesn't mean what the average person walking by, seeing Rook Chapel up there at Bucknell University for all these years. They say, see, you have your God, I have my God. Oh, no. When God... <laughs> spoke out of the burning bush, when God spoke out of the fire in the mountain, when God brought the children of Israel together at Mount Sinai, here's what he said, because I have already saved you by grace. Notice, he didn't give them the law and then save them. He didn't give them the Ten Commandments, then bring them out of Egypt. He brought them out and then gave them the Ten Commandments. We don't get saved because we're obeyed. We obey because we've already been saved by grace. And when he got them there, he said, because I've saved you by grace, and now you're my people, and I'm your God. You can call me your God only because I've saved you by grace. See, this term, your God, means you're in a covenant with God by grace alone. And if you are in a covenant with God by grace alone, here's three things, and we're done. Here's what a relationship looks like. If you understand that you're a sinner saved by grace and you now can go into the, exalt, the presence of the exalted God by grace. Number one, do justice. Act justly. This word, by the way, mishpat, is almost always in the Old Testament connected to four vulnerable classes, the widows, orphans, the immigrants, and the poor. And it's astounding that of the three things that the Bible here tells us should be marks of believers in God. If you're a Christian, here's one of the three marks is that you should be deeply committed to de helping and caring for the most vulnerable classes in your society. To act justly means to care for the poor, the immigrant, the marginalized, the most vulnerable classes. It's one of the three things. Then secondly, to love mercy. It's a powerful, here's, here's why that's so powerful. The word mercy is the Hebrew word kesev, which is the word that's usually translated steadfast love, and it usually refers to God's love. His God's steadfast love is his counter-conditional love. He loves you unconditionally, counter-conditionally. He doesn't love you because of who you are. He doesn't love you because of what he's getting out of the relationship. He just loves you, period. And when it says we're not supposed to be characterized by mercy, it doesn't just say we're supposed to act justly and live mercifully. It says we're supposed to love mercy. It means we're supposed to love to live like this. We love people whether we're getting anything out of it or not. We're committed to people even if we're upset with them, even if they're letting you down. We do not give up on people. We stay in relationships with people even if those relationships drain us. So it's supposed to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. What does it mean to walk? That's, that's a metaphor, but it's an important metaphor in the Bible. When you walk, two things are happening. 
you're having a relationship. If you're walking with somebody, you're talking and you're going someplace. And therefore, many people over the years have said that when it says you should walk with God, that means three things. You're exposed and totally accountable. You're befriended and totally loved. And you're growing and gradually changing. The way you know you're in a vital relationship with God is, first of all, you're exposed. When, when you're walking with somebody, they can see everything you're doing. Don't try to hide it. To be exposed and totally accountable means that every single part of your life you expose to God. You don't just let God into part of your life. You don't just turn to him. You don't, you're not one way in public, another way in private. You, you bring him into every part of your life. That's what it means to walk with God. Secondly, befriended and totally loved. Walking in the Old Testament, walking in the New Testament, walking in the Bible is a metaphor for intimacy. It means you've got to have a prayer life. It means that you've got to have a two-way prayer life. What does that mean? You've got to sense him speaking to you through his word. You've got to have an actual palpable sense of his love in your life. That's what it means to walk with God. It means to have a, an experiential prayer life. And then thirdly, it means your walking means progress. It means you're changing. You're happier than you were a couple of years ago. You're more peaceful than you were a couple of years ago. You have more self-control. You're changing. You're growing in what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, humility, faithfulness, self-control. Look, C.S. Lewis puts it like this. See, goodness is really not just niceness. It's newness. And C.S. Lewis says this. He can make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a dazzling, into dazzling, radiant, immortal creatures, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. He can make us into bright, stainless mirrors which reflect back to God perfectly his own boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long and in parts painful, but that's what we're in for. Nothing less. Get a vision for newness of life. Let's pray. So, Father, um, we see that what it means to be good. It doesn't mean just to be nice, and it certainly doesn't mean just to try our best to live the way we think is it's well. It means to have a relationship with you, the exalted God, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and then to have our lives transformed so that we do justice, we love mercy, and we have a vital relationship with you. Help us to apply these words to our life. Everybody here, if they were listening, you're putting your finger on their life in some place. Let them respond. Help them with your Holy Spirit to do so. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening today. Gospel and Life's ministry is supported by generous partners all over the world. Your gifts allow us to share the gospel message with millions of people through our podcast, radio, and other channels, including here on YouTube. We're seeing God change lives through the increasing reach of this ministry, so thank you for your part in it. If you'd like to make a gift today, go to gospelandlife.com slash YouTube, and we'll send you one of my books as thanks for your gift. Thank you again for your generous support, because... The gospel really does change everything.